This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. There is absolutely nothing in this world that is more important than knowing God. Than knowing God deeply and richly and intimately. And if you really want to come to a deeper knowledge and love of God, the Gospel of John is a great book to which to turn. When we think about the book of John, in John 20, verses 30 and 31, we find the theme statement. Many other signs, therefore, did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Paul would write, I want to know Christ, Philippians 3 and verse 10. David would tell his son Solomon, only know the God of your father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, 1 Chronicles 28, verses 7 through 9. We know this, that when the Lord Jesus returns, he will take vengeance on those who know not God and have not obeyed the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. So the book of John is a great book to look at in order to know God. In John 17, verse 3, we see this truth. This is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God, and the one that you have sent, even Jesus Christ. Out of 866 verses that make up the Gospel of John in our English translations, 419 verses contain words spoken by Jesus himself. That's why the book of John helps us to know God and the one that he has sent, even Christ, in a most remarkable way. As we study the book of John, in order to know God and Jesus even better, one thing I'd like for us to do is look at seven key words of the book of John. In the 21 chapters that make up the Gospel of John in our English translations, one word that we really need to see and appreciate that is a recurring word throughout this book is the word believe. Some 98 times in 21 chapters, the word believe occurs. And the word believe, according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, a dictionary of the Greek language, the language of the time, says that believe means joyful trust conjoined with obedience. Notice the three elements, joy, trust, and obedience. These things were written that you might believe, John 20, verses 30 and 31. When we take a look at the book of John, another word that is accentuated is the word father. Father, the unique relationship that Jesus has with the Father. For example, John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. In John 14, verses 1 through 3, in my Father's house are many dwelling places or mansions. Yet another word that is emphasized throughout the Gospel of John is the word no. No. And the word carries with it the idea of knowing in a deep and rich and intimate and personal way that there is an object that is known and there is also an objective behind that knowledge that we know God and that we have a proper relationship with Him. In John 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. A fourth word that we need to emphasize in the book of John is the word sign. And that's how John speaks of the miracles of Jesus. They pointed beyond themselves to someone and something greater. Jesus, God's son. The expression sign is found some 17 times in most English translations. Yet another expression found a great deal is the word abide. 
abide. And in John chapter 15, especially, we notice this word abide being found. Sixth, consider the word life, life. Jesus said, I have come to give life and give it more abundantly. John 10, verse 10. John 3, 16. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the life that John speaks about in this marvelous book about God, knowing God, is a life of the greatest quality and life in the greatest quantity. But also when we think about the book of John and some key expressions that help unlock the overall message, the basic message of the book, there is the word glory. Glory. Found some uh, 42 times in the 21 chapters. He says in John 17 and verse 4, our Lord does, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you've given me to do. What a remarkable statement. So when you think about these words, they help us see something of the significance of knowing God and seeing him in this great book. But not only are there those seven great words that we've just talked about, there are also seven great I am statements of Jesus. Seven great I am statements. Who is Jesus? Hear from the lips of Jesus himself who he is. When one turns to John chapter 6, verses 35 through 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He is to be the staple of our very existence. In John 8 and verse 12, in John 9, verses 5 and 6, there's another I am statement, a second I am statement of Jesus. And he says, I am the light. John is fond of contrast, death and life, light and darkness. Jesus is light. As we continue looking at the book of John and what Jesus had to say about himself, we come to John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, there's two I am statements. In John 10, he says, I am the door. I am the door. And in John 10, in verses 11 through 18, he says, I am the good shepherd. Think about Jesus in these ways. How has he spoken of himself. How does he describe himself? One goes on to John chapter 11 and look at verse 25 and Jesus says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. Who is Jesus? He is the one who gives hope, hope that extends into eternity. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, there is a sixth I am statement of our Lord. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And in John chapter 15, and especially the first 11 or so verses, there is the statement, I am the true vine, and we are to abide in him. So we've noticed seven key words. We've also noticed seven I am statements of Jesus. But it's also good by way of introduction to the book of John to know God, to see something of his power. And John elaborates seven great sign miracles of Jesus. It's so striking to see the power of God. Jesus showed power over nature, over disease, over demons, over death. And those are four very broad categories. Truly, he must be God in the flesh. He must be the Son of God. And the seven miracles that are recorded for us in the book of John that were performed during the earthly ministry of Jesus, they indicate who he is. They point beyond themselves to the truth that he is the Son of God. In John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11... Jesus turns water into wine. In John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54, he heals a nobleman's son. John is being selective, but he's giving us the perfect picture of Jesus. Who is he? He is God. Only God can do these things. 
In John chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, what does the Lord do? He heals a man who had been lame for 38 years and had almost lost all hope. In John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, he feeds 5,000 men. In John 6, 15 through 21, he walks on water. In John chapter 9, he heals a man who had been born blind. And in John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus when Lazarus had been dead for four days. Truly, this man must be God in the flesh. Truly, he must be the very Son of God. And so we've noticed seven great words that are key words in the book of John. The seven I am statements of Jesus in the book of John and the seven sign miracles that we read about in the book of John, six of which are specifically called signs. But let's look at the book of John itself briefly. And let's look at how John gives us picture after picture of Jesus. Picture of Jesus after picture in his character, in his person, in his work. And how when we put all of these pictures together, we must indeed say, there's nothing on earth more important than knowing God and the one that he has sent, even Jesus. In John chapter 1, notice verses 1 through 4, which emphasize the deity of Christ. That's the picture that we are given. He is God in every sense. Whatever makes God, God, Jesus has that stuff. He has those qualities. He has those attributes. The Word was with God. The Word was God. You keep looking at John 1 and verse 14. And the Bible says, We beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1 and verse 18 speaks of how the Son, that is Jesus, has declared the Father. He has exegeted, He has exposited, He has brought out fully all that God is in His person, in His nature. You see, John 1 deals with Jesus as the Word of God. Colossians 1 deals with Jesus as the image of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, deals with Jesus as the Son of God. And Philippians 2, 5 through 11, deal with Jesus as being in the very form of God. The Word of God, the image of God, the Son of God the form of God. John chapter 2. We see Jesus in his humanity. We see Christ in his humanity. He was present at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. Our Lord was not some hermit. He was not someone who lived his life in total isolation from others. And we see Jesus concerned about others. And in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, this first miracle, this first sign he did in Cana of Galilee, and it manifested his glory. How thankful we should be that we have a God who engages us. A God who has a sense of humanity. He was present at the wedding feast. We know that he was tired. We know that he was thirsty. We know that Jesus wept. And John, in such remarkable ways, shows both the deity and the humanity of Jesus. John chapter 3. We see Jesus as the great teacher. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, come to him at, comes to him at night and says, I've got some questions for you. And Jesus speaks of the importance of the new birth of being born of water and the Spirit, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. It is significant to bring out that while many religious groups don't want to take water as a reference to baptism, but rather as some kind of symbolic thing, you look at John 3 and verse 23, water means water in John 3, 23. You look at John chapter 2 and turning water into wine, water means water. You look at John chapter 4 and Jesus dealing with the woman at the well. She had gone forth to draw water. 
The most natural meaning of water in John 3, 3 through 7, is indeed water. And I believe it is also a reference to water baptism. So we look at Jesus, and he is the great teacher, the master teacher. Never a man so spake, John 7, verse 46. They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught as one having authority and not as one of the scribes, Matthew 7, 28 and 29. What a teacher. Jesus dealt with matters of life and death and eternity. How practical and powerful he was in his teaching. In John chapter 4, we see Jesus as the great soul winner. He deals with the woman at the well in Samaria, and there are so many issues at work here that could have thwarted this lady coming closer to God. She was a Samaritan, Jesus a Jew. He a man, she a woman. He the sinless son of God, and she a woman of some past, shall we say. And yet Jesus works through all of these matters to the point that she comes to the conclusion, can this man be the Christ? And she goes back into her town, and she brings people to hear Jesus. He that wins souls is wise. Proverbs 11, verse 30. What shall a man be profited if he should gain the whole world? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Jesus, the great soul winner. Those who tr truly know God and love others should reach out to others with the message of Jesus. John 5. What kind of picture or photograph is given of Jesus? He is the great physician he asked a man who had been lame for 38 years, would you be made whole? Would you be made whole? In John 5, 1 through 11, well, certainly that man would be made whole, but it was going to make such a difference in his life, especially when he'd almost given up all hope of ever walking. Jesus asked us the same question concerning sin. Would you be made whole? In John chapter 6, Jesus is the bread of life, the great bread of life discourse, John 6, 35 through 48. He is what we need in our life. Whatever else we have in life, if Jesus is subtracted, if minus Jesus is how we do the arithmetic, something is terribly, terribly wrong. He is our all. Colossians 3 and verse 11. In him all the treasures of wisdom truly are hidden. Colossians 2 and verse 3. What a marvelous God we have. In John chapter 7, notice verses 16 and 17. Notice the picture, the photograph given us of Jesus. He is the authority. He is the authority. He says in John 7 verses 16 and 17 that my doctrine is not my own. And then he says something most interesting, most significant. He says that doctrine either has at its source the Father or oneself, heaven or men. What is the source of what you believe? Is it God and his inspired word, the Bible, and specifically the New Testament? Or is it simply opinion, tradition, or your own whim or desire? In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, who are you, Jesus? He is the liberator of the enslaved. If you continue in my word, he says, then are you truly my disciples? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, for freedom did Christ set us free. Galatians 5 and verse 1. Not simply the Jews from the bonds of the law, the Old Testament, but Jesus sets us free from sin, Romans chapter 6, especially verses 16 through 18. John chapter 9. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the light. John 9, verses 5 and 6. He is the one who sheds a lot of light on what our real purpose should be in life. 
In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, there is a passage I love to refer to as the weather whatever verse. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. He is the light and we need to see in him what our real purpose is. It's to know God, to enjoy God, and to love him with our all. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. We look at John chapter 10, and Jesus is the good shepherd. We see this especially in verses 11 through 18. He is the good shepherd. Now a shepherd was everything to the sheep. He would protect the sheep. He would feed the sheep. He would lead the sheep where they needed to go. And how true it is that the Lord is to be my shepherd and your shepherd. Remember Psalm 23 and verse 1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord, He is a powerful shepherd. The Lord is, He is a positive shepherd. The Lord is my, He is a personal shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He is a practical shepherd. He is everything to me. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. O words with heavenly comfort brought. That's what a great hymn says. In John chapter 11, we see this picture of Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, if any man believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. On that occasion, there were a lot of grieving, hurting people. And Jesus gave some of the most comforting, hope-filled words that are ever found in Scripture. He is the resurrection and the life. No wonder why Paul would later write in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, Philippians 1 and verse 21. To depart and be with Christ is very far better, Philippians 1, 23. He is the resurrection and the life. Again, John chapter 12. When we look at John chapter 12, we see the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we see how the people in fulfillment of the Old Testament cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We see Jesus, the King, the King. It is so important that we see Jesus as Savior, that he is our Savior. He paid a price that we could not pay ourselves. But it is also vital, it is necessary that we see Jesus as Lord, as King. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Revelation 19, 16. He is the blessed and only potentate, 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16. He's the King. That means we are His subjects, His servants. In John chapter 13, we see Jesus... We see him as the great servant. Notice the contrast. He's the king in John chapter 12, but in John chapter 13, he's the servant. In John 13, 1 through 17, he washes the feet of his followers. The king who serves. The king who left the glory of heaven and came here to earth, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Oh, what a God we have that He serves, that He blesses, that He paves the way and sets the type of example that we really need for knowing how to live our lives to show that we know God, that we love God, and that we truly enjoy Him fully. As we continue, look at John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. Without him, there is no going anywhere. Jesus is the truth. Without him, there is no knowing anything. Jesus is the life. Without him, we really are simply dead men and women walking. How we need him. John chapter 15 
Jesus is the true vine in whom we are to abide, we are to hold to, we are to cling to. Apart from me, he said, you can do nothing, John 15, verses 4 and 5. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, fruit in him, John 15, verse 8. In John chapter 16, who is Jesus? He is the giver of the Holy Spirit, John 16, verses 13 through 15, given to the apostles to guide them into all truth, to bring to the remembrance the things that the Lord had instructed them. When we look at Scripture today, we see things that have been brought to the remembrance of those who are present with Jesus. We see all truth that God wants us to know. In John chapter 17, Jesus is the great intercessor. That is the picture given of Jesus. He is the great intercessor. Listen, listen. Jesus is praying. He is praying for himself in John 17, verses 1 through 5. He is praying for his disciples, his apostles, in John 17, 6 through 19. And then he is praying, beginning in verse 20, for those who had come to Jesus, who had come to God on the basis of the apostles' teaching. Notice that in John 17, 20 and 21. Jesus, the great intercessor, shortly before he is to be tried and crucified, what is the Lord doing? He is praying. He's praying for himself, for the apostles, and for all, potentially, those who could come to him through the message of truth, the gospel. In John chapter 18, what's the picture that we have of Jesus? He is the model sufferer. He is the model sufferer. It is Jesus who says in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom, his people are spiritual in nature. That's what we should be as the people of God. There's no need to be looking for some kind of earthly kingdom concerning Jesus because the kingdom is spiritual in nature. Daniel 2, 44 and 45. The church. In John chapter 19, we have the uplifted Savior. It's Jesus as the uplifted Savior. That's the picture. John 19, verse 30. It is finished, paid in full. He said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. John 12, verses 31 and 32. And on the cross, we can say, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Jesus, the uplifted Savior, John 19. And we see in John chapter 20, Jesus, the risen Lord, up from the grave he arose. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, from the dead, Romans 1, verses 3 through 5. By many infallible proofs, he showed himself to be alive after his death, Acts 1, verses 3 through 5. Yes, Jesus arose. And in John chapter 21, what is the picture that we're given of Jesus? We see Jesus as the restorer of the fallen, the restorer of the fallen. He takes Peter and says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, Lord, I love you. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Because Jesus specializes in bringing failures, broken down flops, if you will, back. He restores the fallen. What is our great desire? It would be to feed his sheep. Do you know Jesus? Do you know God?